All right. Okay. So I guess we're recording. Um, so, hey, everyone, this is Joe, and today I'm speaking with Brandon um, about we just we haven't had a conversation in a while, so we figured this would be fun to do this again, and we're yeah. probably going to upload this to both channels, so hello to my followers and your followers. Hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, like... Um, we, you suggested we just talk a little bit about our craziest psychedelic experiences, and I guess maybe I can start it out, because I don't know, I think my experience is pretty crazy, and yeah, no, I'm sure it'll be interesting from both sides. Um, yeah, do you want to uh, first say, like, what substance it was, and how much, if you know, um, yeah, um, even so if it's a rough estimation? So the story pretty much speaks for itself, and I'll I'll get into that. Um, but the substance okay. is mescaline-containing cacti. Specifically, it's the Bridgesy strain. Okay. Um. So, uh, you've not have you ever done mescaline? I haven't yet. Um, okay. I'm, so I'm interested like, to I I've done uh, mushrooms and LSD at this point. Pretty high so, doses like, on both of them. <laughs> I'm like, I almost consider myself like the mescaline guy, you know, like, yeah, because it's like mescaline is the reason I'm passionate about psychedelics. Like if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't be, who knows, even if I would be interested in it. Um, Cause for yeah. me, the mescaline experience just deeply resonates with me and it's unlike anything else I've ever experienced. Um, so, but anyway, to get into this, so honestly, this trip was pretty much the result of bad planning, a little bit of stupidity, and a little bit of just assumptions. Like, I made certain assumptions. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to sort of set the stage, so first of all, we had this, I was at a music festival, um, and I have a lot of experience with San Pedro. San yeah. Pedro is a very specific strain of mescaline containing cacti, but I had gotten a batch of Bridgesy and I pretty much assumed, well, this is probably pretty much like San Pedro. It's probably pretty much the same thing, right? Yeah. But that really was not true. Well, there is like some similarity, like Bridgesy is just way more intense and way harder to control. Um, yeah. So this this was also at a time in my life when I was just smoking a lot of weed. And like, yeah. I sort of did it mindlessly. Like I didn't, um, so anyway, like I got to the festival and like, I just, like I smoked weed when I got there. And mm -hmm. I didn't really think much of this because like I was smoking quite a bit of weed at the time, you know, and then, it came time that we were going to drink the cactus juice. And I'm like, well, with when I'm drinking San Pedro, I, I'll chug it. Like, I'll drink it. I'll literally drink as much as I can physically drink, right? And, like, yeah. I might have a strong experience, but it's, like, I can handle it. I know I can, right? So I treated the bridges -y like that, and I just drank it, like, as much as I could, and yeah. that turned out to be a really big mistake. <laughs> yeah. Because, so, um, when you combine that with the fact that, like, I was already high, basically, like, it started to come on, like, really, really strong to the point where it was, like, it became clear pretty quickly that, like, I was not in control of that. Yeah. Um, and so... One interesting thing about the mescaline experience is it's extremely stimulating, like overly stimulating. Like you feel like you are like, like it, it's hard for me to even compare it to anything else, but it's one of the most stimulating feelings I've ever had. Right. So mm -hmm. to have like the overwhelming trip when you're that stimulated, it's just another type of insanity. Because, like, so, like, mushrooms are not directly stimulating, right? So it's, like, yeah, it, it's just a different thing, right? And mm -hmm. um, so anyway, like, I literally ended up, like, 
like completely losing touch with reality. Like I was literally like gone. And um, when you lose touch with reality in a public location, like they'll take you to the yeah. hospital. <laughs> so basically oh, that God. happened. Like they, oh, like, God. <laughs> right. Like they took me to the hospital in an ambulance. And Holy the thing shit. is like, I was okay. Like in reality, I needed like, a place to lay down and like some people to watch me, you know? So yeah, it's like this, this in reality, cold. like, like my health was not necessarily in danger, but like, they didn't know that, you know? Yeah. This um, was, this runs a lot of similarities with my trip that I'm going to talk about. Like, yeah. So like, and honestly, the hospital when not needing it and everything. <laughs> yeah. And so the thing for me is that like, it was actually more embarrassing than anything for me. Because uh -huh. I don't know, like, I feel like I'm just a person who I naturally get embarrassed easily, right? And I've gotten better at dealing with this. Like, I've gotten better at, like, not caring so much what people think. But it's, like, for me, like, physically, I was okay. So it, it wasn't an issue of me necessarily being scared. But it was, like, I like, I consider myself this, like, experienced psychonaut who can handle it right and you know what i mean like like i sort of have mm -hmm. a little bit of my ego involved you know what i mean so like yeah for me it, it's just more of like this embar it's more embarrassing than anything um but just a few things i would say about it is like first of all mescaline is so intrinsically euphoric that it's hard to have a like quote unquote bad trip mm -hmm. so Basically, even if you're totally losing your mind, there's an aspect of it which is extremely pleasurable. So, like, even though this trip was very bad, there were aspects of it, even when I was totally gone, where there, there was, like, a type of bliss that I was experiencing. And, yeah. and the best p fact I can uh, point to with this is that when the people were coming over to me, and they were like trying to figure out what was going on and everything. I thought they were trying to figure out what I was on because they wanted some. Because because uh -huh. clearly I was having such a good time that they just really, really wanted to figure it out. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, be, and yeah, so like um, there, there was this aspect of it, which even in the worst case scenario, it was pleasurable to an extent. Now, obviously, like, this was a massive screw-up, right? Like, this is not the correct way to go about this. Um, but yeah. um, um, I guess it sort of just shows you that, like, psychedelics are not um, entirely safe. Like, these are very powerful tools. Mm -hmm. with, we need. To yes, they are. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, and the... Yeah. I, I made several mistakes in this situation, um, right? Like I should have had better supervision. I should have, I shouldn't have made an assumption that one strain would be the same as another strain. Yeah. Um, so like th there were many mistakes that were made, you know? Um, but um, at the same time, yeah, I guess that's a story that you learn from and I guess that's all you can do. You know what I mean? So, it's a mistake is a mistake, but. So before we go off of this experience for you, I want you to try to explain exactly what it was that you're feeling. I know these things always like escape verbal language. Like you can never do it justice, but like for the viewers, how would you describe like when you lost touch with reality? Like, what would you say? That so was like? first of all, the thing is on psychedelics, you don't black out. If there's a closer, the a closer description would be whiting out. Yeah, right? I can. B because like, it's not like you go into this just dull space where there isn't anything, right? Like this space is very alive. And yes. I was having an incredibly brilliant insight into the nature of reality. And um, I felt like it, it was like reasoning with me in this highly complex and sophisticated way where it was, um, and I felt like everyone I knew was there. 
and everyone that I knew could hear and could see what was going on. And it was mm -hmm. it was speaking things about the nature of reality that were so subtle, but it was just like threading the needle perfectly in order to show me how it's true. Um, do you do you remember some of the insights? So, um, the it for one thing, it was definitely showing me like the sexual nature of reality that okay. reality like is an expression of sexuality and that that is like the the fundamental way to understand it um so you were getting a lot of like insight into like masculine versus feminine existing everywhere or yeah so um on a lot of different psychedelic trips, I've had an experience of like really profound glossolalia. So glossolalia is like this sort of like speaking in tongues. But like mm -hmm. for me, when I experience glossolalia on a psychedelic trip, I literally feel like I'm hearing the voice of the universe. And I've, I've spoken in tongues on on a trip before, mm -hmm. uh, and and it's it's quite the experience. I know for me personally, I, I felt like uh, I was communicating with like intergalactic intelligences that were just so far beyond like what we normally could even imagine. And then it's but it's like you're here having this experience doing it. You know, it's real. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it lit it felt like even more profound than having a conversation with like an intergalactic intelligence, right? Because like yeah. an intergalactic intelligence is still less than the entire universe, right? Because like there's oh, well, yeah. billions of galaxies, right? So it's like uh -huh. on some of these experiences, I felt like it was literally getting you to the heart of what the entire universe is saying. And, yeah. um, but one thing that I have noticed is that, like, on each trip, there are sort of, like, subtle variations in this glossolalia. And there is, like, a lot of common ground. But the glossolalia seem to be, like, announcing the sexual nature of reality. Okay. And, like, like, um, um, it, it, like, and the thing is, like, it wasn't this English sentence, you know what I mean? But, like, it seemed to contain the phrase, like, ladies and gentlemen. Like, that's what it was saying. It was like, ladies and gentlemen. And then it was announcing the thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so, that's interesting. Um, yeah, and it was like... It was do like... You, do you feel like uh, the people around you at the time might have gotten something from it, even though it's not in a language they can understand? Do you think, like, energetically that that somehow that message was, was being broadcast through you? Um, so I do believe that, and actually this is, that's a really good question. So I do believe that glossolalia is like a major, major potential, like sub niche of psychedelics because, yeah. and I do think it's possible for people to potentially like speak in glossolalia to each other or for, like, mm. me to speak in glossolalia, and even if you were sober, like, maybe you wouldn't entirely grasp it, but I feel like you would get something from it. It's like because there's I, some magic in those words, you know? <laughs> right. I really believe that, you know what I mean? And I think what's sort of required is having someone who wants to do that. You know what I mean? Having someone yeah. who has like a deep enough interest in it that they want to have this shared experience because that's the thing, like it's such a profound experience. And one thing that I've noticed is that when I fall into this glossolalia trance, like it feels profoundly personal. Um, be so it's like even like when I'm having the experience and I'm speaking the words in my mind and I get to a point where like I can say it out loud if I want to, I tend to find that I don't necessarily do that because I tend to find that like I would be being very vulnerable 
to just speak it out loud and to just yeah. proclaim it because it just seems so utterly profound. And like, th- I don't think there's anything wrong with it, obviously. Like, I think it would actually be good to share this with more people. Um, mm-hmm. But that's just sort of like the sense that I get from it, you know? Yeah. Um, Where are you based out of, by the way? I'm in curious. Western Massachusetts. How about you? Okay, so, uh, well, I'm, I'm Indiana, so. Okay, so pretty far unless one of us is going to yeah. travel, but... Yeah, did, didn't know if um, maybe in the future, maybe my first mescaline experience, I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess we won't get into too many details on camera, but yeah. who knows, you know? Um, yeah, but, I, uh, I don't know anyone else who, who uses it, uh, to be honest. A lot of other people are into shrooms or DMT or LSD is really common, but... Um, I've not heard of like anyone around me uh, doing mescaline. And so one way that I actually like to think about mescaline is honestly, I could talk for a long time about mescaline, but I think that the reason that mescaline gets so little attention is not necessarily an accident. It's just, it's hard for me to believe that. Um, so, um, I think a lot of people consider mescaline their favorite psychedelic once they've done it. But the problem is that because it's, it's kind of legal, I think people are afraid of jeopardizing its, its legal stat in terms of like, you can legally possess the cacti that contain mescaline, right? Yeah. So I think people are afraid to speak about it too much because they don't want to jeopardize that. So, like, let's just do an example. Like, would I be able to order online the cacti and then, you know, get the juices out of it or whatever and consume it? So or, the thing is, is, what's it's the le- regulation there? It's legal to order the cacti, but it's mm-hmm. illegal to, to get anything juice. out of it. Yes, right. yes. <laughs> Which is obviously absurd, you know? But Yeah, um, it's, it's like uh, with... With mushrooms, you can legally possess the spores. Um, They're sold online all over the place. Um, But as soon as you start cultivating, then it's an illegal process. Um, But I I actually, uh, I'm I'm not going to say the church's name because they're they're a little bit against that. But I recently joined a church um, for the purpose of doing ayahuasca ceremonies legally. And uh, other branches out in the West, I think, do uh, mescaline ceremonies as well. And those are fully legal if you're a member, which they only let members do it. So uh, that's an, uh, in, just an interesting side note for the legality. Um, it's protected under the First Amendment. So it allows people to have experiences and be fully legal, um, which I think a lot of people don't know about. But maybe that's a good thing, too, because maybe if too many people did it, they'd say, oh, this isn't real religion. This is just people trying to get high. Yeah. So, I mean, I really do feel like we're on the precipice of psychedelics being more widely accepted, you know. So, yeah, we are like, how are we going to get to that point? Like, what's the path forward? Um, But, um, yeah, so mescaline is a extremely unique psychedelic, like. It's unique in, it's, it, I mean, I, I think it's unique in every way. Like, I, I almost don't know where to start with trying to explain yeah. it. Um, but um, um, it's mescaline induces a trance of profound euphoria. And um, I think that, has the potential to be very healing. Yeah. Um, um, so did you have any more questions about my experience or before we move on and talk about yours or? Um, maybe we can revisit it in more okay. depth if we feel like, um, but I'm, I'm good. I, I have a handful of experiences I kind of want to talk about. Um, 
the most recent one, which you watched the video, the short version of the video for, um, was my 10 tabs of LSD trip. And that one has a lot of similarities as this mescaline trip for you because basically took too much, didn't didn't know what you're doing, and you you lose control. And I was actually hospitalized too, um, but this was act I was actually hospitalized mainly for uh, my bipolar disorder. So uh, taking this high dosage of acid, the 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 way that I did it is I was going to take five tabs. Um, which is still a lot for, for most people. Most, from what I've heard, the average person will take anywhere from one to three, and three is like the absolute cap. Um, the first time I took LSD, I took three, and then a few hours later, I took three more. Um, but there's a strong um, effect where, uh, what's the word? I'm losing, losing my mind here. I can't think of the perfect word for this. Um, tolerance. Yeah. So it builds up a, a quick tolerance in your system. So if you take more during the trip, it's actually like taking way less than the actual amount as far as what's actually going to affect you. So I, I, the first trip that I had, I took three and then a few hours later took three more tabs. And then um, my second trip, I just took three tabs. And that trip, I don't know if it was just bad, weak acid or what, but all it felt like was a really strong marijuana high. And that was really uh, disconcerting to, because I'm, I'm taking these for like spiritual realizations and, you know, expanding my consciousness and understanding the universe. And then I take three, three hits, like what a normal person would take as their maximum and then all i get is a, a strong marijuana high basically it was it was it was really disappointing so uh this time i wanted to take more but i was going to take five so instead of taking three and three and the tolerance being an issue i figured if i take five it will still be a stronger trip than my previous trips and i'll get more insights and i'll, I'll love it so i took five and then Two and a half hours later, I was still not feeling any effects at all. And normally it's like an 45 minutes to an hour and a half to set on. And then you're basically fully in the experience after an hour, an hour and a half. So it was two, two and a half hours later. And I just said, screw it. I'm going to take the other five tabs that I have <laughs> because this feels like it's not even working. Maybe I'll get something if I take more. Maybe it's just really weak acid. And I found out that it wasn't, it, it was perfectly fine acid. But um, the, the thing that I did very stupidly is um, my friend asked if I wanted to go to the bar. And I thought, well, this acid isn't working, so I might as well go have a good night. Like I was really disappointed that I wasn't going to have a trip because I had been planning it. And you know how you look forward to trips sometimes. Um, especially when like you're kind of bored with your normal life, it's like the perfect little spiritual, uh, vacation is how I look at it. It just resets everything for me. So I, I was like, not going to get this experience. So my friends took me to the bar and I didn't drive cause they were like, well, you took that much. It might not be hitting you, but like, just in case we're not going to let you drive. And that was a very good call. <laughs> so anyway, as soon as we get to the bar, it all hits me. And I'm like, as conscious as I've ever been conscious, maybe more conscious than any other substance. Um, just because this was a very high dose that I took. And um, I'm just sitting there like, it, it sounds stupid, but I'm just like sitting there looking at like a cheeseburger in my hand. And it's just like the most profound experience I've ever had. <laughs> Not, not that I've ever had, because my other psychedelic experiences are pretty profound, but maybe to a normal person, that would be like, that would be the craziest thing they ever experience is like being in my shoes, looking at that cheeseburger on 10 tabs of acid. <laughs> it's, it, it just, uh, it sounds so stupid, but um, basically the, the only way to describe what I was experiencing while I was at the bar was I was just highly conscious, highly aware. Um, 
and uh, there was just so much detail in everything that I saw in front of me. Every moment seemed to drag on for quite a while. And uh, but anyway, like this is all just the beginning of the trip. And my friends take me home a couple hours later, and I'm happy to go home because that was a horrible environment to be tripping in. I wanted to trip initially in my house alone, just me and nothing to interfere with the trip. Um, so I got back home. This is maybe four hours after or five hours after I ingested the, the first uh, five hits. And uh, this is when things started to get um, really crazy. So I know we've spoken about non-duality before and how that's something that like shrooms give you insights into non-duality. And a lot of people who, who take shrooms come to that like mindset and they see the value in that. Yeah. Um, I, I actually did. I, I think it was on this trip. I, I thought about your idea of di divine dualities. Um, and I did actually see like a lot of validity in that while I was in this trip. But uh, what happened next was basically kind of like a non-dual insight. And uh, I went into something that I, I personally call and other people talk about this. They talk about God consciousness. Um, the sense that came over me was that, and I've had this in other trips before, and even when I wasn't on substances one time, um, basically you created your entire reality that you live in right now. Like you, like it wasn't like God or some other entity other than you, like, no, you, you are God and you literally created everything about this life, this existence, but you don't know that you did it until you take something to, or meditate or do something to become, to come to that level of consciousness to where you remember that. Um, so I, I started to ex experience, and it's uh, one thing I want to clarify too, is it's not like your ego self created the entire universe. That's not what we're saying here. It's more like your awareness created everything and is generating everything that, that exists for you. So um, anyway, I, I got the sense that, okay, I created everything. I also... <laughs> Uh, I talked about this um, in that video that I think you watched. I'm not sure if you watched the whole thing, but um, I also got insight into my own incarnation here because a lot of non-dualists and, and people in Eastern religions will see reincarnation as a real thing. And essentially you'll live, live through different lives. Um, but I, I got insight and this is what, this is what the, fun roller coaster ride to go on like <laughs> like you could choose jesus or you could choose joe or you could choose muhammad or you could choose brandon Rowe. and that's it's like you go on that one at the at the theme park and they've got like the the little like extreme badge so like they've got the number system of of what what tier of roller coaster is this one well, the LSD was telling me that like through my mental illness and psychedelic trips and learning about non-duality and all these things and, and experiencing God consciousness on two separate occasions before this, that like this was the most fun ride to be on. Um, so that's that's one thing that was a bit shocking because I still don't know if that's a, a true thing or if that was just like a realization that you have in in a psychedelic state and then it's maybe not as valid as something that you would experience in a normal waking state of consciousness but anyway so the next thing that happened and this is where uh you talked about losing control on your craziest trip this is where i lost control and lsd has actually been something that takes my control away far more than mushrooms do I feel like even even when I'm tripping very profoundly on mushrooms, I don't have the urge to like go outside of my house 
or contact anyone. I basically follow the rules that I set for myself in that trip usually. But on LSD, that's not what happens. And uh, I learned from a friend that this is basically because LSD works not only on serotonin, but it also heavily triggers dopamine in your brain. And dopamine is your risk versus reward. So your, your risk and your reward is completely altered, your, your sense of that. So in full what I would call God consciousness, feeling like <laughs> higher chakras open up and everything like that, which I don't know if you've ever felt chakras open up on psychedelics. It's quite an interesting thing because then you find out, okay, this, this whole model is real. Um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm operating in higher chakras. I'm, I'm feeling what I would call God consciousness. And I decide to strip all of my clothes off and then go run down my street naked with no shoes on. But there was like, there was like no pain in this at all. There was, I could not feel pain basically. Uh, because I was running on like rocks down the street with, you know, and it was just really odd, um, that I was doing that and not feeling any pain, but I felt the most free that I've ever felt in my life on any psychedelic. It was like pure freedom. It's like someone created a drug that, that triggered the, the pure freedom experience and they just injected it into my arm and I felt pure freedom all limits were all limitations were gone i was basically infinite at that time that's how it felt so i'm i'm running down the street in this like infinite freedom uh you know feeling my higher chakras open up and uh this family i i i think i just noticed them on their porch or they might have said something to me i don't remember but either way i had a very strong inclination to go talk to them while I'm fully naked and I, I go up to them and I'm talking to them for like five or 10 minutes and they're like, they're not like mad at me or anything. And then like, I, I get the urge that I should go into their house with them and like <laughs> teach them, teach them like brain and Rose gospel, you know, I'm going to unload spiritual beauty on these people and they're going to love it. And then they're like, Hey man, don't come inside. We've got kids in here. So they were cool. They were cool talking to me naked on the street, but they did not want me around their kids, which I don't fault them for for <laughs> thinking that. <laughs> that would be very strange if you're like a 5-year-old boy and then all of a sudden some naked man comes inside and starts, you know, teaching a new form of spirituality to you. Um so basically, they tell me we can't do that because you're naked. And I say, okay. And then I, I say to them, and I get the sense that they're just very confused about the whole experience. <laughs> and then I, I just say to them when I'm running away, I'm like, you guys are going to love this. <laughs> like thinking about me being like fully awakened for the rest of time, the rest of my life, I'll be like this. That's basically how I said that. Like I'm going to start start a new church, like start professing Brandon Rose agenda across the, the galaxy. Like <laughs> that's kind of how I felt while I was running or <laughs> running away from their house. Um, and it's really interesting, you know, when people hear about that part of the trip, they, they start to think, you know, there are a lot of negative things that could have happened to me at that moment in time. Uh, you know, I could have been arrested. I, you know, I could still be in jail to this day from that. Maybe I don't know how how seriously they police and the legal system take nudity, but um, that didn't happen. And I I have a theory for why that didn't happen. And I I had this thought while I was on the LSD, is that if you've ever heard about vibrations or like the law of attraction, it was basically like my higher chakras were like vibrating in a, in a way and sending out energy around me that um, no one could really come to harm me, at least in a spiritual sense, while I was going through that. That's what that's how it certainly felt to me. Right. So and you if that's seen if that's true, I don't I don't know. But that was the the insight that I got. But what and were you maybe you say? didn't seem dangerous. You know what I mean? Like, no, you seem no. very happy and 
you know, I like was they pure. I was pure love, you know. And, uh, so, so I don't think they were, and that's kind of what I mean by like the vibes or the vibrations that I'm sending off. Like it's an intensely positive thing. So it's hard for even if I come to your house and I'm naked, you still don't really judge it in a threatening way. Um. So, so I yeah, like I think one thing that both of our stories shows is that like. Okay, you could probably maintain control on two hits of acid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or three hits of acid. Like, we, we are not necessarily inexperienced with psychedelics, right? Like, yeah. we can control ourselves most of the time, but, but one there is less a dosage than, that you hit. And, and if you get there, you're fucked. Right. And when you're going that deep, it's just important to be very careful about your set and setting, right? So, yes. If you had taken 10 tabs in a room where you were basically locked in and maybe you had someone there to supervise you and they wouldn't let you leave, you know what I mean? And they were there in case you did anything yeah. stupid, then it's like you probably would have been fine, you know? And I mean, luckily, yep. luckily you did still turn out fine. Like you're okay. You're here, you know? Yes. Luckily. Um, it was a very risky to take that dosage and not have a designated trip sitter not to say that i couldn't take that dosage in the future future with someone and it'd be fine but doing it alone is something that you know or even doing it at a, at a festival like you did because there's a difference between like one person being with you and the trip being able to go at its course versus being around like many people you don't know and then that's like every person there is another person you could interact with in an inappropriate way and then put yourself into some type of trouble or like having to go to the hospital. So for me, the, the experience ended in uh, one of my trip probably lasted about 24 hours of, of intense um, effects and then probably another 24 hours or so of, you know, still, still tripping and there's actually an interesting story I have about, um, but I'll get to that in a second. So I tripped for, you know, let's say maybe up to 48 hours because of that high dose. Um, and the trip ended and one of my friends asking me if I needed to go to the hospital. And I really wish that I was in a sober enough state of mind to tell him, no, the hospital isn't what I need right now. What I need is to go get some sleep. I'm going to go home, take an Ambien and sleep this off and I'll be good the next day. That's what I really should have done. But when he mentioned the hospital, I was like in such a blissed out accepting state that I was like, sure, why not go to the hospital? What's wrong with the hospital? Let's go. <laughs> and then uh, I go. And I get admitted for, I think, 10 days in the psych ward, <laughs> basically because of showing manic symptoms and then also taking the LSD. So they knew when I got there that I took the LSD. I was honest with them about that. Um, but uh, there was a point where, uh, you know, I was there 10 days and that was very excruciating. And being there in the hospital was not the right place for me. It actually made my mania symptoms worse. And I kept doing things to like essentially retain my high to where they were giving me like a stupid amount of medication that like should have, you know, knocked any normal person on their ass, like any normal bipolar person on their ass. But um, I, for some reason, I kept like finding these loops of meaning and like humor. And one thing I did while I was in there is they forgot to take a ring away from me when I was admitted. And that was actually like, that's probably, I, I might sue them for that because they, they really should have, should have never let me go into the psych ward with, but I basically made a joke in my head about the Lord of the Rings and this being a ring of power. And I'm going to eat this ring just for fun. And I swallowed it. Um, wow. And I swallowed the ring and it's like, those were the things that I was doing to keep myself basically still high off the main um to where they kept giving medications and it didn't work and there was a point where uh they they were planning to admit me for 90 days wow and i would have lost all my rights 
I would have had no way to get out of there for 90 days. I probably would have lost my job. I would have probably uh, lost my uh, my connection with my business partner. We do rental real estate together. It's like a lot about my life could have been fucked up by this manic episode that was started by taking way too much LSD. Um, so I've learned that uh, I, I probably won't be doing a psychedelic for a while. And the next one I do will probably be mushrooms because I have more experience with them. I don't lose control on them nearly as much. And I'm probably, if I take LSD, it's going to be years from now. Um, and it's going to be in a completely different way. It's going to be, I'm definitely going to have a trip sitter. I'm definitely going to, uh, you know, put a lot of things in place to make sure that I don't go to the hospital. Um, just a lot of things need to happen. But I found that for me and for people with bipolar disorder, LSD is probably one of the worst psychedelics you can take because when you take a drug like cocaine that, that operates mainly on dopamine, that can send you into a manic episode. And when you take, even if you take an antidepressant, something that really stimulates your serotonin and gives you more, that can trigger a manic episode. And LSD has both of those within it. Um, and when you take a high dosage, it affects both of those systems of your brain very profoundly. Um, and it basically creates a recipe for disaster, uh, which I learned. And, you know, it, it, it had me even questioning if I'll ever do psychedelics again, because the risk of going into a, a strong manic episode where I basically lose my entire life and all of my freedoms, you know, that's very scary to me. But I think, honestly, if I uh, approach things in a different way and use a different substance, well, uh, like mushrooms that I've had a lot more safety with, uh, I'll probably be fine. But um, I'll probably, it's going to be a while if, if I ever do a, an unsupervised trip again, too. Because I basically need, like, one person there who I can trust that knows that, like, this trip will be over in X amount of hours. And Brandon doesn't need to go to the hospital. Because if I go back to the hospital, uh, it could fuck my entire life up. Um, but, but if you think about it, that's sort of a sad state of affairs that... I mean, the hospital should be there to help you. You know yes, what I mean? It, it but, should be. But, but that's but not, not the right. They're not right. Like um, you're you're treated in a sense as like a high grade animal. You know, you're treated uh, maybe more like a pet. You know, you're not treated like a human being. You're not treated as rough as like a, a cattle probably is a cow. But um, it's a it's a very sad state of affairs that people can't go to a hospital for help and then be released with their freedoms as soon as things look good, you know, cause they were, I think the 90 day, uh, hospitalization, I don't think there would have been any getting out of that once I was admitted for those 90 extra days. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's very eye opening for me, um, realizing, and, and I think, uh, my story will probably help a lot of people with bipolar disorder if they hear it to know which psychedelics are kind of a little bit better for, for, uh, people with bipolar disorder and then which ones you should be a lot more careful around, but there's just not that much information out there on the internet about this, uh, about like what dosage can, a a person who's bipolar take versus a person who doesn't have that specific mental illness. And, and what's so interesting like it's is a like, bit like a duty of mine to help explain this and get this information out there. And those are some of my most, uh, in my most popular videos are the ones talking about bipolar disorder and mushrooms and their, the interaction between the two things. But what, what were you saying? Well, I was just going to say, it's like, you can handle a certain dosage of LSD, which is interesting, right? So it's not like a bipolar person can't take LSD. It's yeah. like there's a certain dosage where you've crossed the line. But the thing is, like, that line that exists for everyone. Be for, yeah, that line exists for everyone. But I think uh, people with with certain mental health disorders 
are more at risk of getting trapped by these things uh, in a negative way. Um, you know, basically because with a normal person, if, if they're admitted to the hospital off taking 10 tabs of LSD, you know, they, they, they might recover from that a lot quicker because they're, they're not getting triggered into a manic episode. But the thing is, even for each person who's bipolar, it, the, the dosage is going to be different, what dosage they can take. Um, so the best thing I could do is just give people a ballpark. Hey, don't take 10, <laughs> don't take 10 tabs of LSD if you're bipolar, unless you're ready to, uh, you know, experiment with those consequences. But, um, yeah, I guess so like when I had my hospital trip, like I was good the next day, you know, yeah. like I, there was no real long-term issue that arose. Like the next day I was okay, you know? So maybe that's sort of a difference potentially. Um, I yeah. feel like that's where maybe it, it seems to me one thing about bipolar, just from an observer's standpoint is that the fact that the manic episodes last for like an uncontrolled duration of time. Right? Yes, they do. So I feel like I've had what I could describe as manic episodes, but like they last for a day and then I go to sleep. Right. Or or maybe I pull one all nighter. Right. Yeah. But then I go right to sleep the next night. Right. But like when you're talking about potentially being awake for multiple days at a time. Right. Uh -huh. Which, yes. like, um, so, like, what's the longest you've been up without sleeping? Oh, well, the manic episodes, uh, one thing about them is they, they can continue even when you do sleep. But the longest that I've probably had on a manic episode where I couldn't sleep at all was probably like 72 hours. Um, even when you want to sleep, you can't. So um, that, that I think that really sort of highlights the difference because like when you talk about a manic episode and you describe it, it's easy for someone who's not bipolar to be like, oh yeah, I've had something like that. Like, but it's like, it's well, a matter all, of degree, you know? Yeah, it is a matter of degree for sure. I mean, we, we all, and I think especially people taking psychedelics can get into manic episodes um, or there, I even talked to a friend who's now doing psychedelics, who's bipolar disorder type two, and that's the, the type with less severe manic episodes. And for him, he could probably do certain substances and amounts that, and not end up going, having to go to the hospital. Whereas if I did them, it's almost a guaranteed trip to the hospital, unless I have the right people around me to keep me from going there. Um, but I think I would have received much better care and I would have been out of my manic episode sooner if I would have never been admitted to the hospital. And that's really sad that, you know, that's the place you're supposed to go to to recover. But they treat you in such a way to that it, it made my manic symptoms worse. All the limitations that were being put on me, you know, you can't have a phone. You can't even have shoes. Um you know, you get to watch television for like an hour a day um, and you're you can't like shake someone's hand. You can't hug someone. You can't do many normal human things while you're in the psych ward. Uh, and it, it to me, it almost like perpetuates the problem, because if I would have just received the right medications and been left to like live my normal life. You know, I might have done some stupid things on the outside in that time, but I probably would have been back under control much sooner because I would have known I would have had the mind to know that I need to take more of my mood stabilizer and that will help bring me down. And I would have been able to do that and and control my own dosage, which, you know, to a doctor might sound like a little risky, but, you know, these are pretty safe medications um, unless you take like a crazy amount. But yeah, it's, it was a really interesting experience. I'm really glad I didn't get stuck in there for 90 days. Um, and I guess I learned some lessons about dosages and, uh, you know, having a, a trip sitter. 
Yeah, that's definitely a really intense experience, you know, but I think it is valuable talking about the, the experience and just accepting it, you know, and not, yeah, because like, it's easy to really judge yourself for it. But at the end of the day, like, I feel like everyone does some dumb shit sometimes that like, you're not super excited to tell people about, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, not necessarily proud of like, you would have done it differently, you know, and Yes. That's how I view this situation. Like, it's not something I'm proud of. Like, you know, like, um, I, but at the same time, I guess it provides you with a little bit of wisdom going forward. Um, yeah, I heard uh, something that Terrence McKenna said is there are, there are old shamans and there are bold shamans, but there are no old, bold shamans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. That's, that's like the perfect saying to encapsulate both of our experiences, I think, you know, because. Yeah. So this brings me to another point that. Um, so. I recently so since I've had my YouTube channel up, a lot of people have reached out to me about their psychedelic experiences and like yeah. some them I've interviewed, but some of them didn't really want to be public about it, but they just wanted to share their experience with me. Um, and this one person who has had a whole bunch of Bridges-y experiences, mm -hmm. um, and he says that the Bridges-y is the strongest psychedelic he's ever done, and he's taken like 17 grams of mushrooms before. Wow. Um, so this bridges -y type of cactus is no joke. Like if you take a high dose bridges -y trip, it's like, so the way this, when yeah, he I probably out, shouldn't, <laughs> honestly, Personally. I, yeah, no, you probably shouldn't. That's correct. Um, but, um, so I had an interesting conversation with this guy because I said to him, like, when you take 17 grams of mushrooms, is there like a point of diminishing returns? Is there a point where the trip just becomes like impractical and incoherent? And he said to me that pretty much anything over 10 grams and there's like a long part of the trip where he just like lays down and has no memory of what happened. Like he would just yeah. be like totally he would feel like paralyzed and then he would have like little to no recollection of what happened. So I, an interesting conclusion that I think sort of follows is that it, um, there's like a psychedelics have a peak dosage, right? So oh, really? I, I feel like a lot of times many people assume that like the more mushrooms I take, the crazier it'll be. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's true to a point. But once you get to a certain point and you're just like... You're basically capped out it. and you might just go unconscious or something. Right. I mean, like, there's a word for that state that it's a little different than unconscious. Sort yeah. of like, I said, it's more like whiting out than blacking out. But you go into mm -hmm. this state where it's very impractical. It's very hard to remember anything. And you just easily forget what happened, right? So, like it's sort of interesting to me that there's like a peak dosage of each psychedelic, right? So like, say with mushrooms, say the number is 10 grams, right? Yeah. If the conclusion would be that if you've taken 10 grams, you've taken the maximum dose of mushrooms that's worth taking. And that's worth so, taking, yeah. And someone who's taken 11 grams has they haven't gone further than you've gone. In fact, they, they're sort of going backwards at that point, right? So yeah, that's interesting. What, what's sort of interesting to me is like, okay, because I would assume that like body weight factors into this. So like, what is the maximum dosage, like say per kilogram of body weight for each psychedelic, right? Yeah. Like th that's sort of an inner. And I think another thing that's interesting about that is that one of the reason that, reasons that psychedelics seem mysterious is because it seems like an endless abyss where there's no limit to how far you can go. But once 
we realized that no, like there's a maximum dosage, like there's a point where you can get to that's as far as you can go, then it sort of demystifies the whole thing a little bit because it makes yeah. you realize like this thing is not necessarily infinite. Like the universe may be infinite, but like there is an end point to these experiences potentially, you yeah. know? Um, like it's not like you can just have stronger trips and stronger trips forever, you know? Um, yeah. And I guess another interesting thing is just like the practicality of it, because like taking just as much as you can, can be very hard to integrate in a meaningful way, you know? Yes, exactly. So it's like when I have this crazy experience where I just freak out and go to the hospital, it's like, it sort of makes me want to, it's not that I never want to have a high dose experience, but I want to be very careful about how much I take and very intentional about how much I take. Yeah. And I want to basically have an intention in mind, you know, and not be reckless about it. You know, being reckless with psychedelics is not wise. <laughs> no, it's not. Um. So anyway, um, I think guess we've gone just about an hour, and I think that was a fun episode. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about today, or? Um, I might stop recording. There was one thing that I wanted to talk to you specifically about, um, but it's a little more private. Um, so I I think I'm good to end it there. I think we covered a lot of ground. We both got into our experiences and uh, also talked about some interesting uh, kind of rules about psychedelic use. Yeah, sounds good, man. So why don't we wrap this one up? And thank you to everyone who's watching. And uh, please subscribe to my channel and Brandon's channel if you haven't already. All right, I'm going to stop it here.